Now, one uh, phrase that's commonly used for an aspect of this whole mm. system that he provided us with is Cartesian dualism. Yes. We've talked about this already. The, you mean the mind-body dualism? Yes, the, yeah. the, the, the division of total reality yeah. into spirit and matter. Yes. Now, didn't this give him a theoretical problem of a very important yes. kind? How did he explain the interaction? I mean, to put it very crudely, yes. how is a spirit able to push yes. objects in the world around? Yes. Well, I'm afraid, frankly, the answer is that he never really did. I mean, Leibniz, somewhat scornfully, said on this subject, the interaction, he said, Monsieur Descartes seems to have given up the game so far as we can see. He did have a theory in a late work, just before he went to Sweden. He wrote a book in which he did curiously try to localize the interaction between mind and body in the pineal gland, which is the body at the base of the brain. But, of course, it barely even makes sense. I mean, the idea that this purely sort of abstract, non-material item Something which is almost, though not quite as it were, the category of a number could induce a change in the physical world by redirecting certain animal spirits, which is what he believed, is so difficult to conceive, even in sort of abstract principle, that it was a kind of scandal for everybody. I mean, a lot of the philosophy of the 17th century, and indeed subsequently actually, addressed itself to trying to find some more adequate representation of the relation of mind and body than Descartes actually left us with. Nevertheless, some form of Cartesian dualism, of distinction between yeah. observer and observed, subject and object, got into Western thought for something like 400 years. Well, I it? think the distinction between subject and object, uh, knower and known, is a distinction which is simply impossible for us to do without. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are indeed philosophical systems that constantly try to say that we simply have no conception of the known independently of the knower. Yes. We make up the whole world and so on. But, of course, the trouble about that is that it's very difficult. Um, well, I mean, ab complete idealism, the idea that everything's there is really a product of our minds, is, to put it a little simply, quite difficult to believe. And we all do, and certainly all science does, depend very much on a dualism between the knower and the known, a, a world which we can know independently of our process of knowing it. What I think very few people now are sent to is the absolute dualism between the completely pure mind and the body. Mm. The, the, the knower has to be seen as indeed, of course, it, it was in philosophy earlier than Descartes, for instance, by St. Thomas or by Aristotle. The knower has to be seen as an essentially embodied creature, him or herself, as it were. I mean, yes. That's, yes. And not just as a kind of pure soul. Yes. What would you say its main <coughs> uh, influence on Western philosophy has been? Uh, I mean, Descartes' influence yes. has been simply immense, yes. and still is. Well, if we summarize it in one thing, is it is that Descartes, and almost Descartes alone, who brought it about, that the center of Western philosophy for all these centuries has been the theory of knowledge. Mm. The idea that philosophy starts from the question, what can I know? Not from the question, just what is there? Yeah. Or how is the world? But what can I know? And not just what can I know, but what can I know? That is, that it starts from a first personal egocentric question. And it is very important for the structure of Descartes' system. Remember, I mentioned right at the beginning that it was possible in his time to think that perhaps science could even essentially be done by one person. But even if you lay that historical context aside, it is a very important part of his enterprise that it is, it is autobiographical. It's no accident that his two great works, The Discourse on the Method, and above all the meditations, are written in the first person. They are works of self philosophical self-inquiry. And this first personal and epistemological aspect, that is the aspect of the theory of knowledge, has been the overwhelming influence of Descartes. Now, given that, that, that all the things are wrong <laughs> with the philosophy yes. that we've touched yes. on, and of course there are more than we have touched yes, on, well. and given that the central concern of philosophy has now moved away from the problem of knowledge, which was made central by Descartes, why is the study of Descartes now as valuable to us as it is? I mean, if I may put this problem yeah. in, in this question yeah. in a personal yeah. way, you, Bernard Williams, you spent, as far as I know, almost 20 years of your life working on a book on Descartes. You must have thought this enormous investment of yes. yourself and your life was worth it. Why? Um, I think for two reasons. I mean, there are, let's lay aside the purely case of historical understanding the role that Descartes has played in getting us into our present situation, where I think that just to know what he said in a little bit of detail is very important simply to understand who we are and where we've come from. 
But the reason why I think that this book, and I say this book above all, I mean the particular book called The Meditations, is a book that one very much, if one's interested in philosophy, wants to read now, is because the path it follows, the path of asking what do I know, what can I doubt, and so on, um, is presented in an almost irresistible way. And the point is, it's not an accident that this emphasis in philosophy has been so overwhelmingly important. It isn't that Descartes, just because he was a dazzling stylist or something of that kind, could kind of perform a long-distance mesmerism on the mind of Europe. That isn't the reason. The reason is because he discovered something which is intrinsically compelling. That is, the idea that I can ask myself, well, I have all these beliefs, but how could I get round behind my beliefs to see if they're really true? How could I stand back from my beliefs to see which of them are prejudices, how much room for there is in skepticism? These are really compelling questions, and it needs an enormous amount of philosophical imagination and work to get oneself out of this very natural pattern of reflection. And another very related question, which comes before you very dramatically in this extraordinarily written book, is not just what can I know, but as we discovered already in the Cogito, what am I? We can imagine ourselves, we have this power of imaginative extraction from our actual circumstances. We can imagine ourselves looking out on the world from a different body. We can imagine looking into a mirror and seeing a different face. And what's important, looking into a mirror, seeing a different face, and not being surprised. And this gives us the idea, a very, very powerful idea, that I am independent of the body and the past that I have. And that is an absolutely foundational experience of the Cartesian idea, that I am somehow independent of all these materials. The Cartesian dualism, though, once you look at it, as it were, sideways as a theory, it's immensely difficult to believe for the reasons that we've touched on. It also has the fact that it's almost impossible to resist if you go at it through a certain set of reflections. And I think the set of reflections that Descartes, with unexampled clarity and force, lay before you to lead you down that path, as I think mistaken path, are so not only powerful in themselves, but as it were near to the bone, that it is a, a prime philosophical task to try and arrive at an understanding of oneself, one's imagination, one's conception of what one might be, that one would free one of that dualistic model. Thank you very much.